Thank you, Father. We bless your name. Thank you, Lord. Church, you may be seated this morning. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Yeah. Yeah. Again, the Bible talks about, in, in the, especially in the book of Corinthians, that as we gather, get, church, let's hear, hear me clear. The, is, church is not a spectator sport, is it? I'm going to say that again. Church is not a spectator sport. It's not a show. It's not about dispensing a religious product and look how cool the show is. Come watch the show on Sundays and then off you go. The, the, the Bible talks about as the church gathers that the Lord would give a word and an encouragement. And, 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 and yes, there's teaching and things that are planned, but there's also as we meet together that the Lord stirs. And we, at our church, we like to give room to that. We're, we don't want to give room to chaos by any stretch of the imagination. But we want to give room for the Spirit to, to say, Lord, what are you wanting to say to us this morning? And so as Gord was sharing, Teresa just really feels to kind of add to that, which totally makes sense. As the Lord's bringing clarity and the Lord's wanting to flesh it out for us. And so I love the way that the, the, the I'm going to preach a sermon on the gifts. Each gift is required. So one person brings their part, somebody else brings their part, and then we get to say, whoa, look at that. So, Amen. So um, when Gordy was sharing that about being, uh, you know, like somebody, it's like somebody was running from the Lord and their feet were, you know, I think the, the decision may have been, yeah, I'm running, but I want to be in him. And uh, with that, I felt like there was someone here that that really speaks to. And as you say, God, I'm, I'm going to take hold of this, um, clarity came. It's like you came out of, out of the darkness and came right into the light. And so that's what he wants for our life. There's two things. You also mentioned purpose. We all have a purpose, but we have a position. What is your position right now? You're seated in here, right? You're also seated in heavenly places. If you've submitted your life to the Lord and given him your life, you are seated with him in heavenly places. That's your position. But he didn't just position you. He purposed you. You have a purpose. So if you are not engaging in your purpose, that could be running from the Lord. You've got a purpose. You've got a position, and you have a purpose. And we all have a purpose. All of us. Just wanted to clarify that. I, love it. I like the clarity, and I particularly, because it, sometimes it sounds like when we're running for the Lord, it's like we've lost our salvation or something like that. Sometimes it's, we're still believers, and there's a turning back to the Lord more fully. And we're going to preach actually about that here in just a few minutes. So I love the way that that ties together for us this morning. Thank you, Lord. Joy. So just before Gordon was sharing, I was seeing this picture of a waterfall, and there was a person standing in front of the waterfall like this. You know, and I feel like God's abundance is there for each one of us. It's in the waterfall, and we just need to step into it and be aware that it's all there. That waterfall, like it's an abundance from yeah. him. So step into that abundance that he has for you. Cool. Thank you, Lord. I just want to... Just by a quick wave of hands, have any of those words spoken to you into your situation? Wave your hand. Praise the Lord. And if your hand's not up, that's all right. We're in a body. And sometimes, you know, we don't need, we can be, we rejoice with those that are rejoicing as we're saying, well, that's, that's speaking to where I'm at. And so, Lord, I just even we respond to that word now in the name of Jesus. We thank you. You've given us everything we need for life and godliness. We thank you for the promises of your word that you have blessed us with every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. These are the promises of your word. And so, Lord, we thank you for that picture of your abundance. You are that living water flowing like a waterfall. And, God, I pray that we wouldn't, we wouldn't stay back. We would jump in. We would jump into the flow. <laughs> a picture from Revelation of the, the waters flowing from, from the temple and getting deeper and deeper. Lord, we want to be in on that flow of your abundance, of all that you promised us. So God, where we've, we've, where we've been standing back waiting for you or, or something like that, God, today we want to engage. We want to step into what you've already provided through Jesus. What an awesome gift. Thank you, Lord. 
Thank you, Lord, that even this morning you've stirred our faith and you are continuing to stir our faith. And so, Lord, I pray that these words, this, that what you're wanting to prompt us, and as, even as individuals, Lord, and as your body, Lord, we say yes to what you're speaking to us this morning. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And everybody said, amen. amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. <laughs> I'll say it one more time. Uh, but let's continue on this morning. And, and I love that some, this, some of this just ties right in where we're going in the Word this morning. Uh, but uh, kids, you could be dismissed uh, for Kids Church this morning. Have an awesome time uh, together as you guys continue. About, I think it's self-control this month, isn't it? Uh, awesome. As you guys can uh, have a, gr a fantastic time together. For the rest of us, if you, if you would, if you've got your Bibles with you, let's turn to 1 Kings. Uh, this is in the Old Testament, First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings. Praise the Lord. First Kings chapter 19. And what I want to do this morning is I, again, I want to preach another sermon in what my goal wasn't to create a new sermon series called Looking to Jesus. We are right in the midst of a sermon series on Galatians. But I really feel a word, just the prompting of the Lord as we begin this new year. God is wanting to say to us as clearly as we need to hear it so that we can respond to it. Church, we need to look to Jesus. And the, the last couple of Sundays that I've been preaching, we've kind of hit this theme again a couple of times. But, but think about it this way. When you make a decision like many of us do in the new year, I'm going to like eat healthy, I need better nutrition or whatever, does it ever work that in one meal you get all the nutrition that you need? No. It's the repetition. It's the repeat. It's the transformation. And so even as we come back to this idea of looking to Jesus, I really sense what the Lord is wanting to do is, is there's a, a need for us to bowl over it a little bit more, to get a little bit more out of it this morning. Uh, and, and we're going to take it from a different angle. We're going to take it from some different passages. But really, it's the same message church, we're distracted and we need to look to Jesus. And if we're going to do, if, I believe God has heaps for us in 2019, but if we're not looking to Jesus, we'll miss it. So, my, so this morning again, I want to come back to looking to Jesus and I want to begin in, actually what I want to do today is I want to take three passages of Scripture that we're going to weave this thing through from the Old Testament, from the teaching of Jesus, and then Galatians. So we haven't forgotten Galatians. We're going to do a bit of look to Jesus, a little bit of Galatians chapter 4 this morning. Um, and just, again, I'm, I, I, let's open our ears to what the Spirit is saying. And what I believe the Spirit's wanting to do, and I'm, what my prayer has been in prepping this sermon, is I believe that there are going to be areas of our lives this morning that God's going to highlight by His Holy Spirit highlighter, and, and then it's our responsibility then to do something about that. I'm going to preach a word, and the Holy Spirit then personalizes that word for you. Can I get an amen? That's what happens when we come under the teaching of the Bible. God then he has this amazing ability to illuminate the Scriptures to us by His Holy Spirit, personalizing it so that we wouldn't just be hearers of the Word, but that we would be what? Doers of the Word. And I believe that the Lord by His Spirit is a master at tailoring the Word for you if we keep our hearts open. So even on a morning like this, the application for you may be very different than somebody else, but it's the same spirit. And God knows where you're at. Sometimes that might be a scary thought. God knows where you're at. But it's the best thing to know. He knows where you're at. And He's leading you and prompting you and, and moving you forward. And so let's begin. First Kings is an interesting story um, in the ministry of two like big figures in the Old Testament, Elijah and Elisha. So just one, even as a kid, I was like, that's so weird that their names are like one letter different from each other, Elijah and Elisha. And, uh, and I just want to look at, at, a, at an encounter between Elijah and Elisha. Both of them operated as prophets in the nation of Israel. God was speaking to them, and then God would use them to speak to the nation of Israel, to its leaders, to actually even the nations around. And we see that actually in the first part. We won't read it this morning, but uh, first, uh, first Kings chapter 19, in the first part of that chapter, God speaks to Elijah in the whisper, 
and gives them some marching orders. You know, go to the king in Syria, anoint that guy, anoint this guy over Israel, and then appoint Elisha to be the successor after you. God gives instructions to Elijah, and then Elijah goes and does what God tells him to do. And I love it. It's not just about one individual or one nation. God's been, God speaks to even the nation next door, Syria, which I still love that dynamic, that our faith is, is not disconnected from reality, but, you know, these nations are even still in existence in our world today. But nonetheless, we see God give Elijah an instruction, and so then he goes and follows up on what God told him to do, which is always a good idea. <laughs> when God tells you to do something, do it. Elijah demonstrates that for us, and we're going to jump into that story in 1 Kings 19, 19. And it says, So he departed from there and found Elisha, the he being Elijah, the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen in front of him. I'm not a farmer, but that seems like a lot of oxen. That's 24, because it's 12 yoke, and you have two ox per yoke. I don't know what kind of ground he was breaking up, but he was working hard, and it also suggests to us that there's probably some family wealth. You don't just get 24 ox and keep them and maintain them. So, you know, Elisha's probably, I don't know, we, we're, spe we're speculating a little bit, but I think it's fair, some inference here from this passage, uh, that he's working here. As we'll see in a moment, he seems to have ownership of at least two of these ox. So what, is this a family business? Who knows? He's just doing his thing. He's being a farmer, which in that culture and day, at least 80% of the population would have been exclusively focused on agriculture because if you don't eat, you don't live. We live in a totally different, uh, very minuscule portion of world history where most of us are not farmers. For most of the rest of world history, most people were farmers, and if you go to third world nations of this world, that's still the case. Anyways, so we kind of disconnect ourselves from, from even uh, some of these realities. But nonetheless, Elijah is just doing his thing with these 12 yoke of oxen in front of him, and he was with the 12th, the last pair there. Elijah passed by him and cast his cloak upon him. So again, well, that's an interesting thing for him to say, or do, actually. He doesn't say anything at this point. Elijah knows exactly what's happened in this moment. In some Bible translations, it doesn't say cloak, it says mantle. This is Elijah passing his mantle onto Elisha. One prophet saying, you're going to be the prophet. You are called of God to do this ministry of being the voice. I love, you know, the, in the, in, especially in the Old Testament, but still in the New, prophets were those that God spoke through the prophet to the people, and priests were the opposite direction. Priests represented people to the Lord. And this, these kind of dual ministries, they work together really, really well. But here we have Elisha now having this cloak which was a picture that they would have all understood. They wouldn't have had like, oh, thanks, Elijah, for I was a bit chilly. You know, thanks for the coat. It wasn't that sort of a transaction. Elisha knew something significant. His life would have been transformed in that moment. He knew who Elijah was, the prophet of the Lord. And he comes on in that moment, passes his cloak on him, and then something interesting takes place. It says in verse 20, and he left the oxen and ran after Elisha. Look at this. Elijah kind of just wanders by, puts the cloak on the guy, and keeps on going. Because Elisha has to run up to get him. I don't know if Elijah was in a bit of a funky mood that day or something. Because he seems a little like, okay, done. I'm gonna, and even in this next comment that he makes, Elisha says, let me kiss my father and my mother, and then I'll follow you. And he, Elijah, said, go back again, for, for what have I done to you? Almost just like, whatever. Because it wasn't really about what Elijah had done. Who had done something significant in this moment? The Lord. The Lord had now called Elisha to be the prophet 
after Elijah. And then there's that later on in, in, the, in the book, there's that amazing moment where Elijah rides up to like, you know, this in, uh, incredible moments as that ministry then totally uh, passes over. But listen to this. He wants to go back again. He wants to go back to kiss his father and mother, say goodbye. And he says to them, go back, for what have I done to you? Verse 21, and he returned from following him and took the yoke of oxen and sacrificed them and boiled their flesh with the yokes of the oxen and gave it to the people and they ate. Then he arose, went after Elijah and assisted him. I love this picture. Elisha had received a call. I believe even in this moment we could say that he, was, he had been anointed in the sense that he had been now commissioned by the Lord for a new area of ministry. And so there are, t and then in his life, something now he knows it's all different. There's no more plowing. It's not about being a farmer anymore. I'm moving into new territory, new ground, new things. And so what does he do? In this case, he, he doesn't look back to say goodbye in the sense that he's pining for the past. He looks back momentarily to close up that chapter and get ready to move into the next thing. How do we know that? He kills the oxen. What's he doing? He's burning the bridge to go back. He's leaving himself in a place that he is now the prophet. There's no turning back to my old way of living. The oxen would have been the tool that he, didn't, he would have used to plow the field, to do the labor, to be fruitful, to eat, to contribute. And what does he do? He kills the oxen. And then even the wood that went between the, the, their shoulders, the yoke, he burns it and throws a party, a farewell party, throws it for himself. I think there had been some joy as everyone else is like, sweet, look, pass it around. Oxen burgers, ox steak, ox tails, I don't know, whatever else they're going to make. I'm sure they were praising the Lord. But what was Elijah doing? Elijah's saying, I'm looking forward. I'm not looking back. And he doesn't just say that. He doesn't just say, oh, God has a great new call for me and keep on doing what he's doing. No, he's like, everything has changed. I'm doing something about it. I'm positioning my life for what God has called me to go and do. And in order to do it, I'm burning the bridge from what was before. I'm not leaving an option to go back. I, I'm cu cutting ties. I'm moving on. There was a sacrifice in that. It, it, wasn't, it doesn't say here it was a sacrifice of worship, but there was the sacrifice in the security, comfort, and knowledge he could have gone back to what he was doing before. In that economy, having livestock was having stocks in the stock market. Like, this was your wealth. This was your potential. And he's like, I'm done with it. God is something new. He's looking forward. And it costs to look forward. Following costs. And again, in our culture, we don't like costs. We like to kind of, I'm going to do it, but it doesn't, we don't like it when it makes us uncomfortable. I, I think more and more in our culture, we, we undermine or undervalue sacrifice. Even sometimes in the church. Sometimes I've heard people, they're like, God's called me to be like a missionary. And then there's people that in the church that are even they're like, well, like, make sure you make a wise and prudent financial decision around this and love. all these sorts of things where it's like when we follow the Lord, sometimes it's going to cost everything. He burns the bridge. He's not going back. I want to take us to another passage of Scripture, Luke chapter 9. In verse 57, doesn't this sound, this story might sound a little familiar to something Jesus said. Jesus, in some interactions with some followers, he says in, in Luke 9, 57, he says this, as they were going along the road, someone said to him, I'll follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, foxes have holes, 
The birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. I love about Jesus' response. This guy, I'm going to follow you. And Jesus is like, this is going to be hard. He doesn't mince words. He doesn't say, this is going to bring you your best life ever, and everything's going to prosper for you. No, no. He says, you're not even going to have a house. Is that what he's saying there? Foxes have holes. Birds have air of nests. They've got houses. They've got comfortable places to go. The Son of Man, the Jesus, has nowhere to lay his own head. Wow, you want to follow? Jesus like, if you, sure, if you want to follow me. It goes on to say a few more things. And to another he said, uh, to another he said, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me go first and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Wow, that's a hard call to discipleship. And then the third one that I want to highlight in particular says this. Yet another said, I will follow you, Lord. But let me first say farewell to those at home. Just like Elijah went back to say farewell. Elijah, though, wasn't... Well, let's see what Jesus says. Let's not... Jesus said to him, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. That's Jesus speaking. Church, as followers of Jesus, this is like, this is, this is a bit challenging, but it's good. Because this is what Jesus said. Sometimes we get into the North American version of what Jesus should be like, making my life better at every turn. And here Jesus is saying... Don't look back. Following me requires a focus, an intention. It, it, it's saying, I, I'm going to burn the bridge. And, and I don't know, we don't know all the details of this story. You know, sometimes, you know, whether maybe, well, actually not maybe, the Lord knew the heart of the guy that was saying, I'll follow you. And in this moment, he's challenging that guy with where his heart was at. And it seems that his heart was double-minded. He wanted to follow, but maybe not wasn't ready to pay the price for that. So he makes this really challenging statement. You know, we might even read that and say something like, who does Jesus think he is to say that anyways? Can't say goodbye? You know, Elijah didn't give Elisha a hard time, and now here's Jesus. Who does that guy think he is? How do, well, let me, I'm not going to ask for hands or even a response. How does that make you feel when you hear Jesus say that to somebody? Don't go back and say goodbye. Like, let's, 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 let's let that sit there for a second. It's one of these moments in the Bible where we're like, oh. We round out our picture a little bit more of who Jesus was. Because the, it's a good question to ask. Who is he? What right does he have to say something like that? Well, let me remind you, church, of a few things. Revelation 22, 13 says that he is the Alpha and the Omega. Revelation, or Ephesians 1, says he is the head over all things to the church. Revelation 17, 14 says of Jesus that he is the Lord of lords and the King of kings. And in John 28, or John 20, 28, Thomas calls out to him saying, my Lord, my God. So when Jesus says, follow me, and he says it in the way that it's now you have to burn the bridge to where you were, you're coming forward to the things that I've called you to, he's not just making a request. My Lord and my God is saying, follow. It's a challenging word. And I want to give us a bit of an illustration here in a moment from Galatians chapter 4 because I think that church was wrestling with some of the same challenge. What are we talking about this morning? I know in my life there's been moments where God has told me to do things and that's required a turning away from other things. I've shared this before, but I'm going to share it again. But for me, it was such a poignant moment when I knew the Lord had called me to Vancouver Island. I'd been presented with a few options. I could have stayed on the mainland and had a job offer there, and I had a job offer on Vancouver Island, and, and I was praying through for a season and asking for wise counsel and, and was convinced the Lord was calling me to come to Vancouver Island. I would be all by myself. I was leaving all my family, all my friends, going to a place that literally I'd only been to twice before in the interview process. I'd never been there before that, didn't know anybody. 
but knew the Lord had called. And I remember leaving my parents' place where I was living at the time and leaving my my nieces and nephew inside and my parents. And I closed the door and it was like this walking down the hall, going to my little Mazda 323, like loaded with my things in the back. And I got on the highway and it wasn't illegal at that time. But while I was driving, I got on my phone. Um, There wasn't, anyways, just clarifying, I wouldn't do it now. I got a sticker in my car saying don't do it and not doing it. But back then, it was still not illegal, probably unwise. But I got on my cell phone, and I called TELUS. And I'm like, TELUS, I'm moving. I need a new phone number. So no joke, on my way to the ferry, cutting, burning, moving on. I got onto the ferry. The ramp went up, and I'm like, here we go. This is a picture. It's not the only picture, but I think it's a pretty power. Like, in my life, I had to decide in that process, and it wasn't the easiest to say, I'm going to be the furthest away from the rest of the family. There are friendship circles that I know will no longer be the same. There are relationships that, although I love and cherish, they will not ever be the same as they were before. But the Lord said, go, so you go. We look forward And again, I had thought, okay, I'll go back and visit once a month because then I'll be able to do, you know, the thing God told me to do and I'll be able to keep the relationships over here and I'll just do the thing. I think it was six months before I went back because it's a new thing. And I'm not saying there's the intentional like, you know, I now hate you and I may not talk to you again. I'm not saying it's like that. But I'm saying when we move into what God calls us to do, there's a cost. Elisha demonstrated it, that he was like, all right, I'm a prophet, I'm anointed, let's clear this stuff out so that I can just then focus. He got a new phone number. Set on a new address. Not going back. The other picture I want to share to us is Galatians chapter 4. And it says, for, I'll read a few verses and then I'll just kind of fill in the context a bit. It says, it, it, Paul speaking to the church in, in, in Galatia. Chapter 4, 8 to 11. It says, Formerly when you did not know God, you were enslaved to those that by nature were not God's. But now you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God. How can you turn back again to the weak and worthless elementary principles of this world, whose slaves you want to be once more? You observe days and months and seasons and years. I'm afraid I've labored in vain or over you in vain. What's Paul getting at in Galatians here? The thrust of the letter really is that the the believers in that city were turning back to an old way of living. They hadn't burnt the bridge. They hadn't finalized the determination to move into what God had told them to move into. They were going back again to the law, like the Jewish law. That they, I think part of the thing is they knew it. It was comfortable. It felt like that was, you know, there was a certain, oh, I feel righteous when I do this. These believers, and I want to highlight this, Paul's writing to believers in Galatians that they were, instead of focusing forward, they were being drawn back, right? The Lord had offered them a new way of living, and they were going back to the old way of living. They were part of a new covenant, But there was a drawback to the old one. Church, I want to encourage us as we move into a new year and continue to almost just the 20th of January already. But it's not too late for us to once again determine in our hearts, I am looking to Jesus. And looking to Jesus also means I'm looking away from the things that would pull me back. I, this is a word I just now, you know, I, as I was prepping, I knew the Lord wanted me to say it, but I feel something in my spirit right now. This is a word from the Lord, perhaps, well, I think for everybody, but maybe for some in particular, you need to burn the bridge. You need to burn the ox, burn the yoke, throw the party, move on, and get on with the Lord. It's time. God has things in store for you that if you will live double-minded, kind of half looking to Jesus and half looking back to whatever it was, you need to determine in your heart that looking to Jesus is not just that I say I'm a believer, that looking to Jesus means I do something about it and it's going to cost me something. 
Maybe you're here today and God has called you in the past to something, given you a dream, a vision, a ministry, and for various reasons, you, didn't, you lost your focus on the Lord and you turned back to the things that you were new and were comfortable and, and were easy. Turn to the Lord, look to Jesus. And even in Galatians, it reminds us, we're not talking about people that now have moved into this camp where they were kind of looking to Jesus, but now they're like unbelievers. These are believers. Galatians chapter 4, I, didn't, I stopped at verse 11, but verse 12 starts with, brothers and sisters. Paul isn't booting them out of the family. He's just saying, you need to be warned. You need to be urged and, and challenged to so focus on Jesus that everything else doesn't matter. And a willingness in our heart to kill the ox, burn the yoke, throw the party, and move forward. You're not going back. And so the question, what are the things in your life that you're running back to that you need to be done with? And again, here's where the Master Holy Spirit applies this word to your life, because this for you is different than for anybody else. It's not about creating some new law where we're all going to like do the, all of us are going to do the thing that's going to demonstrate our willingness to do this. We're all going to show up next week with this item or thing, and we're all going to burn it and throw it apart. We're not going to do that today or next week. But there may, because there, there's different things. The Lord knows your heart. The Lord knows what you draw to. What have you left the door open to that you need to slam the door and then maybe even burn the door? Be done with it. I'm, I'm purposely just pausing here for a moment because I know the Lord is filling in blanks because He does it really well. If our ears are open, what are we living with that's causing us to be half-hearted? Looking at Jesus or trying to, but we keep doing that. What old patterns do you keep running back to? In the Galatians, they, they kept, kept running back to the elementary principles of this world that if I do enough good things, then I'm good enough. They, they found comfort in self-righteousness, familiarity in it. And Paul, Paul's saying, you have to keep looking. You don't turn back. Keep your eyes on Jesus. And here's the thing. It, it's easy to turn back because we're familiar with where we came from. It is often hard to look forward because it's an unknown adventure. And the unknown often makes us uncomfortable. Anyone uncomfortable with the unknown? Anyone else like to know all the details before you take the next step? Maybe the details the next 10 steps before you take even the first one? We're humans. But what has Jesus invited us into? Follow me. Follow me. And often that looks like, I, I have never met anybody who the Lord has just laid out every little step of their lives. I've not yet seen it. If that's you, well, I don't even know if I want to say bless you because it would be nice to have that sometimes, but the Lord doesn't do that. Why? Because he's calling us to an adventure of faith. He's saying, trust me. Follow me even though it may cost you what you valued and thought was important. It may cost you what it in the world system looks like you should be doing. If you saw, often it's the case that when we choose to follow Jesus, there will be others that will call us unwise. There will be others that will tell us, you really should do this, that, or the other thing, and make sure. But if the Lord says, go, we go. And it's often helpful when we burn the bridge so we can't go back. Because I bet you there was times for Elisha when he's like, man, can I just go back to farming? But he eliminated the option. Isn't that interesting? Elisha didn't command him to do it. We have no indication that the Lord said do it. But Elisha, I, I wonder if he just knew his heart better than he knew that he needed to do that, so he couldn't choose to go back. So I want to encourage us, and I hope you're encouraged, challenged. I'm not sure what it is. 
Church, let's look to Jesus. And in looking to him, let's turn our eyes off of the things that would draw us backwards. Dan, if you could give him the keys, that would be amazing. I think, if, I think we've said enough. Now it's, Lord, what do you want me to do? And so do you, if you just want to play again, why, why do we ask somebody to come to the keys? Yes, it does sound nice, but we often find it helps us focus and remove some distraction. And, and if we could just bow our heads, I'm not, you, let's stay seated even for a few moments. Let's kind of close our eyes so that we kind of create ourselves a little spot between us and the Lord. And I want you to just come with your heart open to God and say, Lord, w- help me flesh out the list here, Lord. What am I turning back to? And perhaps it's actually really easy for you to already identify. You already just know. So now I want to give you an opportunity to make some decisions. If it's your purpose and your desire to look to Jesus, might I challenge you this morning, believer, to be willing to burn the ox, throw the party, close the door to move forward. And so in a moment like this, I'd encourage you, challenge you to say, Lord, and then start filling in the blank that you, Lord, I'm going to turn from this thing. Lord, give me the strength, the boldness to walk that out. I think it often involves us identifying the things that we know draw our hearts away. Lord, and then bring them right to him. Open our hearts to the Lord. He already knows, but there's something about us confessing. And then saying, Lord, I'm done with that. I'm moving forward. I'm looking to Jesus. Well, Lord, as believers are praying in this room, I pray you'd give us a heart like Elijah. Elisha, who knew he'd been anointed, he'd been called, and was eliminating the option to go back. Lord, I thank you in the same way your word tells us that as believers we have been anointed. We've received a high calling from the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. From you, Jesus, who have all authority. And now you've called us into service, each of us. And so, Lord, I pray we would, with wisdom like Elisha, deal with the past so our eyes can stay focused on the future. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that you're speaking to your people by your spirit. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Can we stand together and let's stay in this atmosphere? I just want to encourage you in this way this morning as we begin to wrap up. It's one thing in this moment to identify the things that are drawing you back. It's another thing to determine that you're moving on. There may be things you need to do this afternoon. There may be phone calls you need to make. There may be, like, let's be real practical. There may be apps on your phone you need to delete. There may be relationships that might, might need to be over. Really practical steps. And it's one thing in this moment, in this atmosphere, to pray it. Lord, give us the boldness to do it and the follow through because we want to fix our eyes on Jesus. And so, Lord, right now, as we conclude our service this morning, Lord, as we continue in this just searching of our hearts, we say, Lord, continue to search us. Know us, Lord. And, Lord, I pray that as you've been speaking and can, will continue to speak, Lord, that we would not just not just re- like sit with the thoughts in our minds for a while and then move on, but Lord, we would make determinations this morning. And then Lord, that you would give us the boldness, the courage to walk it out. Help us to be like Elisha. There's no going back. There's no going back. Lord, empower those decisions. Every intention, every purpose that we have that is good and in line with your will, Lord, would you enable us in that today? Thank you, Lord. 
we just wrap up with the chorus of a song. We sang it already this morning, but I thought it was perfect. Again, Deanna didn't know my sermon in advance, but picked just the right song. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No, t- She did not know the sermon that I was going to preach this morning, but has given us the words to pray as we come with the Lord. Let's sing that this morning just as we conclude. Thank you, Lord. I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back, no turning back. I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back, no turning back. I have decided, let's sing it from our hearts, decided follow Jesus, No turning back, no turning back. I have decided, follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning. The cross before me, the cross before me, the world behind me, no turning back. No turning back, the cross before me, the world behind me. No turning back, no turning back. Lord, let our song be our prayer this morning. Lord, we give it to you as we give ourselves afresh to you in this year. Lord, I thank you that you are calling us to new things. You are calling us to more depth of relationship. God, we don't want to settle just for a nominal Christian life where we kind of every now and then acknowledge the right thing and all that stuff. But Lord, we want to go all in as disciples, as followers of Jesus, because we know that in following you, we find the fullness of life. Thank you, Lord. We hear your call, King of Kings, and we say yes. We say yes to you even today. And so, God, I bless your people this morning. I pray, even as we've already prayed this morning, would you fill us afresh with your spirit? Would you empower us with all the strength that we need? And, God, would you lead us into the purposes and plans that you have for our lives? We say yes to you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And God's people said, amen. Church, let's look to Jesus. Keep our eyes on him. If you'd like prayer this morning, the prayer team would be available for you up at the front. We love you. Be blessed. Have an awesome week. We'd love to see you at 3 o'clock for OSL. (laughs) We'll talk to you soon. Be blessed.